I'm going to talk about why I hated my mother. When I was very young, I used to hate my mother. Hate. I used to hate her so much. I, I was convinced she wasn't my mother. That she couldn't possibly be my mother. That my mother was somewhere watching, waiting. She probably had me when she was a teenager and was ashamed to keep me and gave me to this woman to raise. And I longed for the day that my mother would return. Probably when I was 18, like the movies always show, and she would come crying and I would hug her and she would tell me why she left me in the arms of this wicked woman. And I would forgive her because I just wanted an opportunity to escape. Let me tell you just how much I hated my mother. So much that in the comprehension test, when I was in primary four, I had the option of calling my mother harsh or kind. I immediately chose harsh. And I was so upset for many weeks because the teacher scored me wrong. How dare he tell me how to comprehend my own mother? Was he the one living with her in that house? Let me also tell you when I finally had enough. First, that evil woman in the name of independence sent me to boarding school in Ikene, far away from her and in another state, the military camp called Mayflower School. So one day, third year in secondary school, I had a minor accident. I can call it minor now. But when I was in school, it was a major scandal. You see, apparently, it's like, um, you see, during a fight with a girl, she slapped me. Then she pushed me. And I fell. In falling, it turned out that I had twisted my ankle. Soon, my right foot began to swell. And the school dispensary could not handle it. So the proprietress, Sheila Sholangi, took me in a car to a hospital in Shagamu. But who knew that a dislocation could be such a beautiful thing? When I returned to school, I had a very lovely time. Everyone fussed around me. Everyone was loving me, taking care of me, bringing food to me from the dining hall, checking up on me. I was no longer required to join the morning jogging, to cut grass with the rest of them, to be at night prep, morning assembly, to walk the long distance to class. It was bliss. After a while, I think they decided that before somebody's child would die on their hands, it was better for me to go home and fully recover. Which meant for this young man who has always hated school, no classes. I went home with joy in my spirit and gratitude to God for a life well spent. <laughs> but do you know what that wicked woman said to me when she cast her eyes on me and saw the big P.O.P. on my leg. Is this why they sent you home? Look, I don't like year year holidays. This will only make you late in catching up with your classmates. You have to go back to school. The hatred that 12 year old me felt for a woman that would not cut any slack for her only child can only be imagined. But today, I think back to those years with fondness, with love, with gratitude to that tiger mom. I am grateful 
that despite bravely surviving two miscarriages that almost took her life, she resisted the temptation to spare the rod. Because what she was teaching me still rings true in my ears and in my life today and every single day. It is not supposed to be easy. That if it is easy, that means something is terribly, awfully wrong. Sometime last year, I placed a call to an, a dearly beloved mentee and told her I had an urgent message. What she was looking for from place to place, job to job, country to country, she would not find. She was looking for easy, and it did not exist. Because I had to reach out and pull her before she gets sucked in like much of our generation. They who quit because they want to be happy now, today, tomorrow. And if they are not happy today and tomorrow, if they don't find that joy, that peace, that fulfillment, that love, that achievement, that position today, then they will quit. Because you know these days, quitting is easy now. The options are plentiful. And so many are the opportunities. And you know, the motivational speakers say you should believe in yourself and anything is possible. And you should follow your passion. Just close your eyes and do what? Jump. And look at Mark Zuckerberg. I mean, look at that guy who sold Tumblr to Yahoo for $1 billion and oh. MG, the WhatsApp founders who sold it to Facebook for $19 billion. Look at Jason and Joku who got millions of dollars last year after the last millions of dollars that he got. Or Adebola Williams who held the Future Awards Africa last year at the presidential villa. Or Whiskid with his 1 million followers on Twitter. Or you know everyone great whose stories we haven't taken time to truly understand. Even the brightest of the lot fail in the day of adversity. Because one eye king in the land of blind men, they are surrounded by a generation of slackers. So they don't know. They don't know that the work that lies ahead to greatness is hard slog. That greatness comes from the hard work you do after you finish the hard work you have already done. Because they think you should always be sunny and joyful and happy and sinless and lovely and bright. So they won't start, they won't move until the venture capitalist arrives. They won't act until they get sponsorship. They won't spend six months before they move to the next job. They won't wait to prove their mettle if their boss doesn't believe their ideas. They won't suck it up and earn their stripes. And when things don't go according to their dreams, they stop. Oh, by God, they stop. Who will tell them that Jason had tried and tried and failed and then tried again and then failed and then picked himself up and then won. Who will tell them that Linda Ikeji confesses to failing at every business that she had tried her hands on? Model management, event management, magazine management, before the multi-million Naira blog. Who will tell them that before Whiskey became a legend and before it became incredibly difficult for me to reach that small boy on the phone, that he had spent half a decade working, toiling, pushing, sucking up to those like me who ran the big shows, before we now have to suck up to him because everybody wants Whiskey now? Who will tell them about the months that I slept in the office? And then in Adebola's house, because I had nowhere to stay. 
Who will tell them? That before we began to run this 54-man operation, which now has offices in Lagos and London and more money that, than this boy from Ijeshatedu could ever have dreamt of having, that we had spent years without an office, with no investment, even from family, friends, or fools, and with no bank account. How can I convince the young man who told me two weeks ago that he hates his job and wants my life? Because, you know, I'm in Abidjan today, at Isababa tomorrow, from my way back from Milan, before I go to London. Praise the Lord. But I was once so gripped by the fear that I, born, bred, and buttered in Nigeria, might never leave this country. And that my only option was to work harder than anybody I had ever known. Even in jobs that I hated. Okay, this is better. Who will tell them that work-life balance, yes, is a lie for those who want to make their mark on the world, for those who want to do extraordinary things. Sleep, yes. Exercise, yes. Good health, certainly. Work-life balance, please. Who will remind them of the gut-wrenching doubt that the Prophet Muhammad first experienced before he gave the world the gift of Islam, or the incredible physical torture and blackmail and self-sacrifice across two decades that Jesus Christ suffered before he gave the world the gift of Christianity. Who will tell them? And so you just want to hold them tight and shake them up and shake them and ask them, who told you it was supposed to be easy? Who promised you easy? Even the truth is not supposed to be easy. Those who truly want to get better know the truth about truth. That it is hard and it is bitter and it is painful and we are human. So we will resist it and we will question the motives and bend the import and deny the reality, we will even kill the messenger. But in our hearts, we should know that the truth is not the truth if it does not challenge, if it does not change, if it does not improve, if it does not scatter in order to build, if it does not make a difference. And that's why it is so special. And that's why it is so pure. And that's why it is so indispensable. And yes, that is why it hurts so bad. Because the saying is true today, as it was yesterday, nothing good comes easy. The things that are special, that are extraordinary, should not be gotten ordinarily. They are supposed to be hard. They are supposed to be excruciating and to be demanding and to be frustrating. Sometimes, many times, you want to give up. But then, you don't. Which is how you win. Because when things get much too hard, that is the exact moment that you have to make the decision to keep going. I learned early in my life that the road I have chosen will be rough. And oh, to run Red Media Africa is rough. It is tough. To pioneer things not done before, or difficult to understand at first, like the future of What's Africa, or YNIJA.com, or IK.NG, it has made me cry. It has made me ill. It has made me sad. It has broken me again and again. I learned early that the desire to do new things, to break a few of the rules, to change the course of things as we have met them, to conquer my inner introvert and my natural comfort with the status quo, and to move beyond that which I am comfortable will stretch me hard. And even now, no one prepares me for the twists and the turns of that road. 
and I have experienced despair, despondency, gut-wrenching disappointment, and the desire to just turn back and run to that which is safe and which is normal and which is comforting. And even now I realize that there are more trials and more temptations ahead, more excruciating decisions to make, more disappointment and pain I must build the capacity to absorb. More enemies I will make and confront. More difficult actions to be taken days and nights spent alone in contemplation and in fear. But I will have it no other way. And I will do none of it differently. Because to arrive at great summits, to savour great joys, one must endure great journeys with great girth. So my earnest prayer for you today is that which the founder of Mayflower Taisholari made for us many years ago. And it is said with love. It is said with honesty. And it is said from the very depths of my heart. May your road be rough. Thank you.